Our brain is a fascinating organ. Injuries or damage to our brain can alter our perception of the world. However, in this video, we will discuss a case report of a patient who, following extensive brain injury to his visual cortex, was somehow still able to see. In the previous episodes of Extraordinary Brains, the patients that we discussed have all been adults. In this episode, however, we will discuss a patient who was examined at a very young age. The story of our patient goes back to when he was only 9 days old. At 9 days old, the patient suffered from seizures and from neonatal hypoglycemia, a condition in which one's blood sugar levels are below normal. Immediately following this incident, MRI studies were conducted to determine whether the symptoms had neurological effects. While these initial studies showed no damage to the brain, a second MRI was conducted 20 days later which showed that the symptoms the patient had suffered had led to severe acute ischemic changes in the bilateral occipital parietal lobes as caused by the hypoglycemia. In other words, 20 days after the incident, doctors had found that the seizures and the reduced levels of glucose in the body had led to reductions in the blood flow and oxygen to the occipital parietal lobes in both hemispheres. Years later, when the patient was 4 years old, he underwent another MRI study where doctors now found extensive regions of bilateral cortical loss in the occipital cortex, both when it comes to white matter and gray matter tissue. As the occipital cortex is involved in the processing of visual information, people who suffer bilateral damage to this region typically develop cortical blindness, which is a type of blindness that is caused by damage to the visual cortex rather than by damage to one's eyes. However, interestingly, despite developing cortical blindness, some patients are still able to discriminate between and respond to some basic visual stimuli. However, oftentimes, for people with this condition known as blindsight, the processing of basic visual information will take place outside of the patient's conscious awareness. What makes our patient so unique is that compared to blindsight patients, despite his extensive cortical damage to the visual cortex, his visual capacity is remarkably well preserved. The patient was, for instance, still able to navigate his immediate environment without any help, was able to identify colors of objects, and was able to consciously read the emotional states in others. Two years following this examination, more extensive testing of the patient took place. This battery of neuropsychological tests included more MRI studies, both structural and functional, and also ophthalmological tests. This examination yielded very similar results as compared to the previous ones. Doctors found bilateral volume loss of both gray and white matter in the primary and secondary visual cortices. Doctors also found extensive damage to the V3 as well as to adjacent areas in the left hemisphere including the inferior parietal lobe and the anterior intraparietal sulcus. Thinning of the splenium of the corpus callosum as well as dilated ventricles were also found. Despite this extensive neurological damage however, the patient could still see. Beyond the visual capabilities already mentioned, ophthalmological testing revealed that the patient showed no impairment in his ability to recognize faces, he had no difficulties in discriminating between objects of different orientations, and he had unimpaired contrast sensitivity which refers to the ability to detect sharp outlines of small objects. Given that the patient retained relatively normal visual perception despite the extensive damage to the visual cortex, an important question is, how is this possible? This question is especially important given that other patients with similar visual cortex damage often can develop blind sight or complete blindness. A potential explanation for this, as provided by the authors of the case report, is that the level of preservation in visual ability is correlated with the age at which the V1 lesion is obtained. The authors supported this potential explanation by arguing that when looking at multiple case reports, the patients who retain more of their visual abilities following V1 lesions tend to be children. The authors also argued that the preservation of visual capabilities in our patients could have been the result of significant rerouting of visual information in the brain. An MRI tractography of the patient revealed increased connectivity between the inferior pulvinar and the middle temporal visual area in the left hemisphere. The author suggested that this pulvinar relay could be the neural pathway that affords the preserved visual capacity in our patients as well as in others who suffer an early life lesion in the V1. We hope you enjoyed this extraordinary brain and we hope to see you in the next video.